So this is Daryl DeAngelis. He's with Ebtron. He sits on um, quite a few committees for ASHRAE. So I think he's well informed on the subject. And we'll uh, see what he's got to say. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Yeah, I volunteered for the 241 committee, but I wasn't selected, and I'm not unhappy about that because, uh, as Carlos said, uh, the timeline was was quite quick. Um, it's a little bit loud. I don't know if we can turn that down a little bit. Uh, the standard process in ASHRAE, as, as Carlos also said, is very not monotonous, slow. I worked on 90.1 in my previous life. Now I work on 62.1. Um, chair of 7.7, uh, .7, which is test and balance. And I'm, I'm a person that believes it's important to know where we've been to determine where we should go. So as, as con con engineers, you should all be very well informed about what things worked in the past and, and what we should do in the future based on what we know about the past. So I'm really going to go into the past in this presentation just so that you have all the information possible because I spent the time looking so you don't have to. Miasma, this is uh, what Hippocrates determined caused illnesses uh, about 400 BC. Um, there would be a cloud of bad air coming over a community and everybody's getting sick. So basically you had a pandemic because of the bad air. Um, and the quote here is from, uh, from the, uh, the Black Plague which killed uh, 20 million people. Um, you know, unlike like COVID, right? So, you know, these things happen. Well, you know, it's, it's true, it's, it's in the air, but how it, how it spreads a little different than, than what they thought. This, this mindset was true in the scientific community all the way up into the mid 19th century. So it's only recently that we really understand it. And we still don't understand. Dr. Lindsay Marr, who was also on this episode of 60 Minutes, who knows about um, how aerosols travel in the air, has been studying influenza for 20 years and she still doesn't exactly know how it works. She just knows it goes through the air and how it transmits through, through hands and everything else. So uh, it's a challenge that we have and, and we, we do the best to provide engineering controls to, to combat these challenges. So what is in the air? We know oxygen's in the air, nitrogen's in the air, CO2, but you know, we know it because other people in, in the past discovered it. Uh, Antoine Lavoisier, known as the father of modern chemistry, he actually named the element oxygen. It was, it was, he, other people had discovered it before him, but he actually figured out what oxygen was used for. He really was focused in oxygen used for respiration, oxygen used for combustion. And uh, when, the more he looked at it, he decided that respiration was actually a form of combustion, so that all of us humans are walking around, we're like, we're like engines are by ourselves, we produce heat from from uh, the, what we consume to keep our bodies alive, to keep our, ourselves moving. So he was very, very much into that. He actually grew up in a, a tax collector family. His father was a, was a land tax collector. He was a tax collector, but he really loved science. So he spent all his time and effort into, into following science. And he really wanted to understand this, this combustion and, and uh, this, this air in the, in the air. So he started looking at, uh, at carbon dioxide because all of us produce carbon dioxide. And it was this theory that, that the CO2 that we were producing through respiration was depleting the oxygen in the space and making the space unhealthy. So he was studying out carbon dioxide. He, he put these people in, in these situations where they're either exercising or sitting still and measuring the amount of carbon di dioxide produced. The woman in the chair behind him um, is his wife, Marie. She was very much involved. They were, very, they were quite a team. In fact, she actually made the lithograph here. She actually made this drawing. She did all the note taking and everything else. She, she was uh, multilingual, so she did the translations because there was a lot of uh, uh, works done in, um, in the UK at the time, and uh, Lavoisier didn't, didn't speak English, so she did the translations for him. That's pretty cool. So he, he, he was concerned uh, about the CO2 and everything else, but really laid the foundation uh, for, our, for our industry back then. Uh, unfortunately, his, his life was cut short by the guillotine um, because of his relationship to collecting taxes. Uh, forget about his, his science and you know, one, one other scientist mentioned, you know, uh, so quickly his head was lost, it would be another hundred years before we even find one like it. So fast forward a little bit into the mid 19th uh, century. Um, we have a, a, a German person uh, from, uh, Max von Petkoffer, he's from Munich. 
and uh, he actually was a chemist uh, taught at the university, known as the modern father of hygiene science, because he really started to, to look at how, uh, what is the pleasures that we have in life, or the things that are making life better actually affected our health. And he determined that uh, the water sanitation, the, the fresh well water and the sewage water in Munich uh, was spreading typhoid and cholera. Um, so he actually laid in, in, in place plans to clean up the water. So he took pipes from, from the mountain rivers, because in Munich you're, you have the mountains around, and, and these, he actually used non-leaded pipes, which was you know, completely unheard at the time, and uh, relayed out the, the sanitation system. And uh, it really produced a healthy society that people were flying all over the world to learn about this guy. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Well, he didn't stop with water. He started looking at indoor air. Because at the time, you know, we, we started building better and better housing and better and better buildings than, than what was in the past. And of course, the primary source of, of cooking and heating and everything else is, is combustion, fire, which produces all sorts of nastiness. And uh, you know, if you, so if you have a really tight space, there's a problem. So he, he started promoting ventilation, promoting an indoor air quality, and, and uh, actually came up with an, a, a measure, measurement of CO2, uh, a chemical measurement, that was used until the mid 20th century, the 1950s. It was his measurement. So uh, he, he basically looked at that. He, set, he, he theorized uh, that a good indoor air quality measurement uh, was 1,000 parts per million of CO2. And we're going to hear this, this, this common theme throughout this presentation, and, and you've probably heard it in, in, your, in your work. But, uh, so he also did testing of people. He, he built this big box and chamber. and, 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 and and uh, measured the CO2 and, and measured other things that were going on. So it's pretty cool. All right, so it's interesting here. I, I, I was, what, what, what title should I make this slide? Engineering controls, because that's really what I felt it was about. But Florence Nightingale was a nurse. Everybody knows Florence Nightingale as, as, as this famous nurse. In fact, she's known as the founder of, founder of modern nursing. Uh, she was born in Florence, Italy. That's why she's called Florence. But her parents were from the UK. They were on vacation. Uh, so she's uh, fairly wealthy parents, and uh, she grew up well educated. Uh, she became a deaconess, and uh, during the Crimean War, which is which is a war that's happening in the Crimean Peninsula, which is exactly where we're having a war today, um, she was supporting the military by by being a nurse down there. And so she, when she first got there, she was aghast. She was she couldn't believe the the conditions of the space. Uh, they were filthy. They were dark. There was no ventilation. There was no airflow. The, po the food was bad. Uh, they didn't. They had lack of lack of clean supplies, sanitary supplies, bandages, and things like that. And so she started tracking things, and she she started to uh, write everything down and, and plead with her for her superiors to to improve the situations. And they started to listen. In fact, she did such a good job of tracking stuff. She created a diagram to visually show people. And this is known as the Rose diagram. She was actually the first one to come up with with this, this concept. Um, and in 1858, she was, she was uh, awarded a, a member of the uh, Statistical Society of the UK, the first woman to be a part of the Statistical Society because of her work. So she, uh, she promoted, again, all this good, good care of the patient, good health in, in, in a facility encompasses all these things that, that it has to be clean. And, and in, so she wrote this uh, Bible of Nursing in 1859, and it's still used today. It's still published today. You can buy it on Amazon for like $5. I don't think she's getting the royalties anymore, but uh, she, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. But in, in, this, in this talk, she talks about the keeping the external air to the person, allowing them to heal because they have fresh air coming in to around them that is necessary. And you said you, you cannot have cleanliness without ventilation. And without ventilation, you don't have cleanliness. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's pretty it. So I mean, that's, that's what I'm talking about. There's a lot. We, we have bad stuff in the outside air sometimes. So you have to be aware of what's in the outside air. But a lot of times, the air inside is much worse. And as Carlos was talking about, you, you, know, you got to measure what's inside the air in it before and after so you know what you're doing. So uh, Dr. Edmund Parks, he was also in the Crimean War as a surgeon. Uh, and he came back to UK, and he got a job at uh, the, the Army Medical Center University. Uh, he was actually put 
made the, ch the first chair in all the UK of hygiene, indoor hygiene. And uh, he was actually appointed by Florence Nightingale, and they actually worked together uh, on, on creating better indoors, specifically for, for, the, for the fighters of the, uh, of the UK, because they were always in war, so they had to take care of the people that are fighting their wars. Uh, so he, he, he wrote this medical uh, hygiene journal. Uh, he took some, some information from Florence Nightingale and other information that he learned. But he was very focused on providing ventilation for health. And here you can see that he recommended 2,000 cubic feet per hour or 33, 33 CFM for the healthy person, for the person that wasn't sick, up to 66 CFM per person for people that are sick. If anybody's worked in, in healthcare spaces and is familiar with 170, yeah, you're probably you're running around that, those rates right now. He used a little hand anemometer. I love this thing. It's, it's, uh, I, I love artifacts of, of, of the HVAC industry. I've been in the HVAC industry for 40 years. My grandfather started a refrigeration business in 1938, so it's, I can't help it if I geek out at things like this, but uh, this is one of the first anemometers. And, and since we, we measure airflow at Emtron, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. All right, so move on a little bit. Just a little bit later in the United States, uh, J.S. Billings, also a wartime surgeon. I think there's too much war in our history. Uh, so he was, he was in the Union Army. He treated both and operated on uh, Union and Confederate soldiers that, that went down. Of course, uh, you know, we're very close to uh, a significant battleground. And uh, he became a pioneer of public health. Looking at his life, he was really a Renaissance man because he dabbled in a lot for what he did. He just started as a surgeon and then he just expanded. After the war, he was a librarian a librarian of medical stuff. And he expanded and, and grew the collaboration of, of medical journal, medical information, which is now known as the, the, the National Medical, medical Library. So uh, he basically initiated that and made it happen. Well, in, a, in, in addition to that, he was learning as much as possible about other things and about buildings. Uh, he, uh, one of the things that he was responsible for is actually change the ventilation system in the, the capital of the United States in DC. He did that. But, uh, you know, so he was focused on, he was writing, there was, a, there was a journal before the ASHRAE journal, long before the ASHRAE journal, there's something called the Sanitary Engineer. And so he wrote an article in the Sanitary Engineer. And in 1880, he was saying that for schools, that the ventilation rate should be 30 CFM a person for the students. Because, you know, one thing about children is, is uh, they eat more, drink more, and breathe more per body weight than, than adults. So, you know, they're, they're, they're growing, so you want to make sure that they're as healthy as possible. So I'm really big on schools with respect to that. He's also known for engineering a whole wing of the Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. Um, he went around the world and studied what other people were doing and he improved upon it. And this be basically became the, the standard 170 at the time, how to build a hospital or FGI, you know, guidelines at the time. So everybody was using this. Uh, and then he, he, he wrote, this is like 600 pages, this book on ventilation and heating, where he went into, he wasn't a DRC engineer, he was, he was a, a surgeon. He, uh, he went into designing systems, it's very laid out, you know, how you should design systems. Now, everything was crude. We th we're talking, this is before Willis Carrier. This is where we're still using coal furnaces and, you know, and steam and everything else. Very, very poorly controlled and, and, and uh, the systems were just burgeoning, just starting to, to come about. But he tried to do the best with, with what they had, and this is what you should do. And in this, he, he, uh, he made a statement which could be written today, uh, basically talking about how schools are not very well maintained and sometimes uh, uh, not designed well. Uh, there's, there's a GOA study um, that, that says that 50% of schools need an improvement in the HVAC systems. We keep throwing money, but it doesn't seem to be going to that. I mean, all, all, all the money that's spent during the pandemic a percentage of it is going to the HVC, but that more of it should be. Um, and, and most of the research that I've seen have shown that schools are running about 50% of what they should be, 50% of ASHRAE 62.1, or what they were designed to. So there's definitely, there's definitely some problems with respect to that. So in this, in this ventilation and heating uh, book, he also recommended these, these ventilation rates. So as a, a typical office being 30, and uh, he actually upped the school in this to about 40 CFM. But um, we're nowhere close to this right now. 
that's why I'm showing you where we are. So he looked at it from a medical perspective. You know, what is good for health? Just like Edmund Parks, what is good for health? And that's not what the minimum code is for, as we'll get on to. So I'm from Massachusetts. And uh, in, growing up in Massachusetts, uh, I have a lot of history, just like we do in this area of Philadelphia. You know, really into the Revolutionary War and everything else. You know, the, 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 sh the first shots of Revolutionary War were in Massachusetts, the Tea Party of Massachusetts. And I'm happy to say that the first law for ventilation was passed in Massachusetts in 1888. A law for ventilation. And uh, in this law, they didn't have building inspectors, they had the district police. You had, a, you had to watch out for the district police to come and check out your building. And they can assess a fine. So they had this form. It wasn't published in a law. The law says this is 30 CFM per person, 70 degrees, you know, and, and here's your PP, PBM limit for CO2. Uh, and they had fines, a $100 fine. Doesn't sound like much, but $100 back then was quite a bit. It translates to $3,500 today, but I think it was a lot more than that uh, for what you could buy. So they can continuously fine. So, and the, the police were the building inspectors for, for Massachusetts for decades. So it was pretty interesting how that came about. So in 1892, there was another act uh, which regulated the, the buildings in the city of Boston proper. And that actually increased the ventilation to 50 CFM per person and 50 CFM per light. Because most of the lighting back then was, was gas lights. Uh, Edison Electric started in Boston in 1886. So this is only six year later, so we didn't have enough time. In fact, if you walk in Boston, I, I, I'll recommend to, to visit Boston. It's a beautiful city, just like Philadelphia. And you can walk around the old section of Boston near the Capitol, it's called Beacon Hill. And the lanterns outside are still gas. They're still running gas. So um, it's, it's pretty cool to see that. You can imagine what they were inside. So they realize, obviously, if you're burning gas inside, that's, that's bad for your health. Uh, so follow through. I mean, Massachusetts was very active at this time, really focusing on the health of, of, of the individuals. And uh, basically, no building can be constructed without ventilations on the plans. What is the method of the ventilation that had to be spelled out before you can get your, your permit to, to, to build retrofit? I thought that was pretty cool. And in 1897, they reduced, Boston reduced it to from 50 to 25, still a lot higher than what we have today. In 1899, they really were focused on, on the health of the building and, and they had the Department of Health, a law for the Department of Health to really that they gave them the ability to, to condemn the buildings. If they inspect the buildings, if they didn't have satisfactory plumbing, um, if they didn't have a good drainage, if they had, didn't have good ventilation, they can actually say, everybody has to get out of the building, you can fix it. If you don't fix it, we tear it down. That's what they were doing back then. Um, and, and fire, the fire codes really started to be a big deal there. I mean, there's actually, in one of the laws, um, how you could not use wooden ducts, because they realized that was a, a chimney waiting to happen be a fire. So in 1914, it feels like fast forwarding, but it's not fast forwarding that much. Uh, ASVI, which was the, the predecessor to ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating and Ventilators, uh, passed a, put together this model law so that it could be incorporated into state laws across the country for ventilation. And these were the recommended late, uh, rates. In their document, they spoke about it's very challenging for us to put a rate on every single type of building, but this, these are the buildings that we know uh, from experience that we can put a rate on. So again, they're looking at that 30 CFM uh, for a classroom, uh, a little bit less for a theater, uh, 20 CFM per person, but still, but a lot more for a factory. There's a lot more stuff going to factory work. In 1917, 19 states had a state law and the District of Columbia for ventilation laws. Of them, 17 were schools, eight others were assembly buildings. and. Not all 19 same, same states, there were 11 states that actually had laws for the factories at that time. So this is, what, this is where we were trending back then. Really improving from where we are, realizing that it's not just water that we should be concerned about, it's also the, the air we should be concerned about. So in 1914, uh, a commission on ventilation in Chicago published this document. And I really like this picture because it shows uh, this, this little tube, and you see it coming up through the floor, 
and, and this tube has this little perforated front that's actually trying to direct ventilation to the students. So they actually set up a mock room to see if this would improve their health. Uh, this has actually come full circle now during the pandemic. There's a lot of talk about, you know, can we, can we provide, we, uh, Carlos mentioned decarbonization many times. I mean, maybe we do a better job if we're, if we're not heating and cooling a whole bunch of air, but, but for, for conditioning the air specific to the person, if we get to that, just like you know, we're all wearing suits. But they, they, they tried this. So this uh, commission went on from 1911 to 1914 and uh, really studied the effect of what was happening. Um, and it validated the 30 CFM per person. They said well, this is necessary. But they really were focused on comfort as well um, and, and performance. And that was really a, a challenge back then because, the, again, the controls, they didn't have direct digital controls. They hardly had pneumatic controls. I mean, it was a very, very tough to control the systems back then. So they, they, they determine, you know, when you're ventilating a building that, you know, you have to control the heat, you have to filtrate good as well and, and humidify. Does anybody know how they filtered back air back then? They filtered air with running water. They cleaned the air through with, 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 with like a waterfall. Air washing, they called it. Pretty cool. Probably energy intensive, <laughs> but pretty cool. Uh, so in, in, in there was another commission set up in, in, in the, by New York, New York State. And interestingly enough, uh, the city next to where I live is, is Springfield, Massachusetts, is, is one of the cities to, to participate in this, in this uh, effort. And it was run by a person, Winslow, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Winslow, who is uh, from Yale, he's well respected, they had a well respected group with them. But uh, after reading the report, I'm really, really concerned. They really were focused on, on again, on comfort. Uh, more than anything else, 30, 30 schools in four states, Massachusetts being one of them, New York being another. And, and they're, they were really focused on the comfort. Again, it's the way the systems were designed back then, I think, was the problem. Uh, when they say the most important thing in ventilating is a thermometer, I know there's a problem. Not, a, not our airflow station, but a thermometer. <laughs> not, not a bunch of air, air monitors. It's not really they want to know how much air is moving, but they wanted to know how to, to temper the air, how to make the air comfortable. There was concerns about overheating. There was concerns about uh, humidity. There's you know, and of course, there's energy concerns. We're spending all this energy heating this air, and then the, the, the carrier was already in, in progress at the time. They were already starting the air conditioning uh, things. The the uh, in the 1930s is when the the capitals uh, in in D.C. got air conditioned. So that is the the greatest concern. Of course, heat is a problem in buildings. People, ASHRAE, that's why ASHRAE 55 exists. You know, s people perform less under, on the hotter conditions and stress. So comfort is, is necessary for performance, but so is not ventilation. Um, and they really looked at it, the space that you had around you is more important than actually uh, the ventilation rate in this study. Uh, so because they couldn't control, or they found that the systems weren't designed very well by the engineers back then, uh, they determined that actually a window would be better. But I think that we learned during the, the, the pandemic that the windows don't work so well during COVID. Uh, there, I can point to some cases uh, where there were schools that had only windows. But you don't have ventilation unless you have a temperature differential or a pressure differential. You need basically air moving through a window. That's the only way you can get it. Or you have you know, pressure as far as wind pressure is concerned. So a window is, is limited to what it can do. That's why not all buildings are naturally ventilated these days. So the smell, what was the smell? Well, the smell was all of us. The smell was all of us. Uh, Yaglo, who worked for Harvard School of Public Health, just like Joe Allen does today, and he did a study uh, which was funded by ASHRI uh, to look at ventilation connected to body odor and what the correspondence of ventilation versus body odor is concerned. Um, and at the same time, he's looking at, at CO2 to see if he can uh, compare the CO2, because each of us is respirating CO2, to, to the ventilation rate. And uh, so he came up with, with this, these ventilation recommendations. The interesting thing is it isn't a consistent rate per person. It's a rate dependent upon how many people are in, 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 in a space. So uh, the more people in the, in the tighter space, the more ventilation. So it has to do with, again, the, the cubic area around you, the volume of space around you, than just that. He also developed this chart, basically shows you know, what, what the relationship between odor intensity 
and the ventilation rate. He said even ventilation rates at 30 or 40 CFM weren't enough to eliminate odor. So they had to figure out what was, what was satisfying. He built this box. He put people in the box uh, of, of, of different odor levels. Back, back then, you know, if children took a bath once a week, that was, that was normal. You know, uh, soap, not everybody had access to soap all the time still. Uh, it's quite different than, than what we have today, so odor was, was different. But the, the, the nose, the, our ability to smell is one of the strongest instruments that there is. We can smell things that instruments cannot. And uh, so he put people in a box. He had these little tubes coming out of the box, and he had individuals walk up and smell them. Because once, once we're in a room, uh, we get acclimated to the smell of uh, each other. That's why you can't smell yourself. You have to have someone else to say, oh, you have bad breath. Uh, <laughs> so, um, because, you know, so it's, it's written that, you know, you know, if somebody walks into a space, you don't want it to be terrible smell. So this is, this is how they figured out. So they figured, well, it's acceptable. Well, they, they figured that this moderate smell, at this level of 2.0 odor was acceptable. And that came out to be about 16 CFM a person is what he figured out much lower than the, the 30 CFM or 40 CFM where they were looking at before. So fast forward to 1973, ASHRAE 62, first version. And uh, one of the key things, key, key things that I like that about this is it talks about, well, why we ventilate the space to begin with? Because we have people in it. If we don't have any people in the space, there's no reason to ventilate. We build buildings for people. The people are the number one asset in the building. Let's take care of the people. And uh, it's very important to say clean ventilation air. Yes, filtration is important. Making sure you're not bringing in, in, in polluted air from outdoors uh, that have fire, all sorts of VOCs and particles from, from uh, wildfire smoke. Filterate them first before you bring them inside. Uh, make sure the air inside is filtered well and make sure you're depl removing the air inside by diluting it. And it mentions that you know you want to maintain oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other air quality levels in the space, because there is other things in the space. In 1981, the one thing you need to know about 1981 is is is, is what they said in the forward here, and uh, they were referencing another standard, 1990, uh, reference 90. Now 90 is 90.1 today, which is the first energy standard in 1975, and the reference how the energy standards said, oh, well, there's 62 people. They, they say that the ventilation rate is, is, too, is, is higher than it really should be. We think it's succeeded by 1.5 to 2.0. So this new committee of 62.1, or 62 at the time, decided to listen. And what did they do? They reduced the CFM from 15 to 5, 10 to 5 in classroom. It's a fall, far from where we are. Well, what, We'll see what happens after that. They also, in, in, in the standard 1981, for the first time, uh, published a, a relationship between ventilation and CO2 because there is a direct relationship between the ventilation rate and CO2. All right, time for a question. Audience participation. Who can name the agency that was founded in 1977? No? Close. Department of Energy. DOE didn't exist before 1977. It, 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 it came about because of the oil crisis, because we had an oil crisis in the 1970s, because energy prices started going up. So they reduced the ventilation, they built tighter buildings, all to address the energy crisis. Hey, somebody else looking at the smell. This is a gentleman from Denmark, Oli Fanger. You can find some videos on YouTube of it with Oli Fanger. He's, he's quite a character. He looks like a character, doesn't he? Unfortunately, he died, he died fairly young, but he was a 40-year member of ASHRAE and, and did uh, many research projects for ASHRAE. Uh, he was at the Technical University of Denmark. And uh, you know, one of the things he, he did was he, he picked up on Yoglo's work and, and, and decided, you know, can he, can he validate what Yaglo did. So he was again looking at odor intensity and, and he actually mapped out the dissatisfied number of people. So he, dis he discerned, they determined that, well, if 20% of the people are dissatisfied, that's acceptable. So at 20% dissatisfied, it was about 1.6 was his number, where Yaglo was around 2.0. 
All right, so he took this 20%. And he actually was able to build a relationship between carbon dioxide, where Yaglo was, and maybe it's better instrumentation than he had at the time. And uh, it, he found out that the, the relationship was fairly linear, that you can predict the ventilation rate and the odor intensity based on, on the CO2 level. So there it's about 1,000 parts per million right there, the 0.1%. And so, yeah, so he took this dissatisfied number of 20%, and he came up with the ventilation rate and an equivalent CO2 level. And this, this seven, seven liters per second is about 15 CFM per person. Um, so is it good if 20% of the people get sick and 80% of the people are okay? This is where we're going from a health standard to, or a law for ventilation for health to a standard for ventilation for comfort and odor. It's not for health, it's for odor. And this is the importance of 241. That's why we're talking about it, how we got to where we, we are now. So this, this, uh, this magazine cover came out in 2001. Is your office killing you? Um, yeah, it's a good question. You know, And it's make, you gotta make sure that we, our offices in the future don't kill us. It's up to us in the room here to make sure our offices don't kill us. Uh, the EAPA published this fact statement in 1991 and they reference uh, uh, the World Health Organization in 1984 that said up to 30% of buildings are getting sick people. People are complaining, they're going home sick, there's, there's a problem. They're remodeled or new. And he says often there's the challenges because the buildings aren't operated the way they should be designed. So the engineers maybe did their best, they followed the procedures and all, but they're still not being operated well. But sometimes there are some bad designs. But if the engineers are following the standard of the day, it's not their fault, right? So they clearly say in this EPA document, is inadequate ventilation causes sick building syndrome. It was 15 CFM per person, then it went down to five. But the one interesting thing is they said that, you know, in the early 1990s, they're kind of misleading here. It wasn't until after Yaglo that we were at 15 CFM per person, as I showed you, we were much higher than that. One interesting thing I didn't mention, I'm just re recalling right now, is during the 1918 pandemic, the New York Commission on Ventilation wasn't active. Uh, New York City and Chicago stayed open during the Spanish flu. The kids didn't go home sick. They were healthy because they had lots of ventilation back then. So uh, they maintain the health. Five CFM is not enough. So EPA said, so they backtracked. So 1989, ASHRAE 62 comes out with another version. And all of a sudden, the rates are updated. So now I'm going to compare the 1989 version versus 2004 version, which is the same rates that we have today. So back then, it was a CFM per person standard. Today, it's a CFM per person and a CFM per square foot. Now, I agree with what 2000, they did in, the, it's actually a den to 2001, but what they did in this version, because they realized that there is off-gassing of all sorts of things, computers, printers, things in the office, um, then you had to provide more ventilation for this off-gassing of the material. But what they did in turn is they reduced the ventilation rate per person at the same time. I would have liked if they kept the ventilation per person and ventilated for the space. So I'm gonna compare some spaces. So we look at a dining room to a restaurant dining room today. It went from, it tends, it went from 20 CFM to 10 CFM. 20 CFM to 10 CFM, if you take both the area and uh, the CFM per person. An office went from 20 CFM to today 17 CF. Not so bad, not so bad an office. We look at a conf conference room. This is really, really gets bad. Okay, went from 20 CFM to 6 CFM. Wow, 6 CFM is just, just over that 5 CFM that was making everybody sick. Why are we doing this? That's the average CFM with the area included because it's, and the problem in, with 62 point right now, right now is, is a lot of high density spaces have lower CFM. Because I think the, the, the people that were working on this back then, it wasn't me, um, were focused on energy as well. And they're trying to minimize that. In addition to having these lower CFM, you can still use demand control ventilation so you can go even lower. And we're gonna address that a little bit. It's significant. From 1989, so we've already dropped throughout history, and now we've dropped even further. And this is where we stand today. The rates haven't changed all the way up to 2022, where we are today, which is the version today. Um, so I, I really wanted to, 
I don't think I'm pointing out that the version of 2022, there's, there's been significant changes in the language that aren't incorporated into mechanical code about how you should uh, operate a building. Um, but I'm gonna focus on, on what it says here. And basically the purpose of the standards is to specify minimum ventilation rates and other measures intended to provide indoor air quality and that is acceptable, which is 80%, uh, and, and minimizes adverse health effects. And where you should have, except the indoor air quality is defined where you have no known indoor contaminants. Well, how do you know? If you're not measuring for all these contaminants, how do you know? Carlos pointed out that measurement is key, and it is. You need, you need, you need to have measurements. If, and and if, if you, ha you haven't built the building yet, it's even more tough. It's, it's more challenging to know what you're going to have in the building after you building, build it. So uh, I heard some one of the audience members saying we're conservative as engineers. That's, yeah, that's why. You want to make sure you're, you're protected after the fact uh, because you can't possibly know what's going to happen after the fact. We only have ideas. So uh, recently, indoor chemistry has been uh, a kind of a new art. art. They're discussing that the oils on the skin actually interact with, with things that are floating around in the air that we can't see, the different VOCs and everything else, and, and forming new things that are happening in the space. Um, ozone wasn't a problem before. I grew up in electric air cleaner in my house, uh, and uh, I could smell the ozone being produced. Uh, and ozone doesn't, doesn't directly hurt you, but what the ozone does is it, it, it connects with other chemicals in the air, and then it goes in your lungs, and it causes all sorts of bad stuff and reactions to it. So that's where, that's where ozone becomes a bad thing because ozone happens naturally in the lightning storms and things like that. In our atmosphere, it exists uh, th when, through the atmosphere with, for, with the sun. Ozone is produced as a normal basis. But too much ozone is, is a problem. And that's why you have to make sure that the air cleaners you know, don't produce ozone, that you don't have a problem creating more ozone in the space, anything that you put in the space. So you can check this out. I put little 3D barcodes throughout this so you can find some information uh, very easily quickly. So let's take a look at the rates as I, as I went through history. Um, it's a significant drop, as you can see, what we had. Uh, certainly the, the Massachusetts ventilation rate for 50 CFM person may be an outlier, but um, Mr. Mr. Dr. Parks recommended that for, for definitely healthcare spaces and for healthy spaces. Um, so this is where we are today, way down there, way down at the bottom. So uh, Johns Hopkins, it's interesting to have the connection from Johns Hopkins to J.S. Billings, who built the, the hospital at Johns Hopkins. But Johns Hopkins, uh, anybody that was following the pandemic and the spread of the pandemic probably went to their website and actually viewed where, the, where, where people were infected and how bad the infection rate was, because they did a very good job at mapping that. Um, they've been an advocate throughout. Uh, the people that were involved on, on, on the, the health sciences side of Johns Hopkins uh, were very much involved with the, with the scientists. Uh, that was saying, hey, no, this is airborne. Washing hands and social distance is, is not going to help you as much as, say, ventilating and, and infiltrating things out and cleaning things out. So they actually just recently in August put together this Model State Indoor Air Quality Act to get states to put ventilation or indoor air quality back into the laws again. This is pretty cool. Uh, and the Rocky Mountain Institute in, in, uh, in Colorado also has produced a guideline. You can see this on their, on their website for for indoor air quality. A lot of things to, to, to consider what we should do. I'm not really a fan of this clicker, but it's working. Uh, also, uh, uh, in, there's a Science Magazine article, a paradigm shift to combat indoor respiratory infection that was, that was produced. Uh, it was re really well written, talking about the importance of ventilation and filtration in buildings and how we can build better buildings. If, if you all, the designers, and I, I was consulting at one time. I was a designer at one time, so I, 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 I somewhat know the shoes you, 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 you live in. You all, the designers, uh, have the opportunity to design in, whether it be Carlos's systems or other systems, but design them up front and make sure that the building is ready for all different potential problems in the future. And not just follow the minimum standards, because they are minimum standards. And if we treat the minimum standards as maximum limits, we're only going to do worse. If we design beyond minimum, then we're, then we're going to do better. Uh, and uh, Johns Hopkins also produced this, this nice document on schools because, as I said, schools have been uh, suffering for a long time as far as the ventilation is concerned. Um, and so this is a nice article if you do any school work to, to review with respect to that. Uh, also on our website at Ebtron, uh, we have a whole section on schools 
uh, with a lot of research, a lot of information about problems in schools. So I'm going to bring up CO2, not because CO2 is a contaminant, because there's a relationship to ventilation, and it's been talked about through history, in the history of this presentation as well. Uh, so it's important to understand, because a lot of people think, well, you know, if I have a CO2 sensor, then I'm, I'm measuring an indoor air quality. Um, and uh, in Carlos' presentation, he, he, he had sensors that had more than, than just CO2, which is a good thing, because there's more than that. Um, yeah, so CO2 is a marker of respiration. It's a marker of people. If you don't have any people in the space, then, then the CO2 should be roughly equivalent to what is outside air. CO2 is naturally evolving. So you have CO2 in the outside air, you have CO2 in the inside air, and it increases with, with respiration. So, but it's not the only thing that's being generated, even by humans. Uh, I talked about in, uh, you know, chemistry, indoor chemistry. Uh, we are clean, cleaner the people than we were in the 1930s and when, when Yagla did his experiments. We don't smell as bad. However, we also use a lot more synthetic clothing. We have a lot of sneakers and synthetic clothes that produce that off gas. We use a lot of body washes, perfumes, hairsprays, things that they didn't have back then, that off gas. Uh, these all get in the air. Uh, if you, you know, we burn candles, we do other things uh, to make the space smell better, where you could just maybe clean the air, ventilate it, or do something else. So there's a lot more things than the CO2 in the air. That's, that's the point. So as, uh, as uh, Oli Fanger figured out that 1,000 seemed like a good number. Uh, it met that 20% dissatisfaction rate. And uh, so it was published in the 1989 standard 68, uh, 62. And that's when they first started to allow demand control ventilation based on CO2. Now you can use DCV counting people, which is a good way. You can do DCV using other uh, uh, sensors. But CO2 is the most widely used, and, and that's why I'm talking about it, and it has a direct relationship to people. Not as direct as counting the people walking into a space. If you're like in, in this type of a space, you know how many seats there are, you know how many seats are full. You can actually count the people instead of using CO2 because this space has volume. And the problem with, and I'm gonna go over it, is that you have to fill up the volume of CO2 before you start making the sensors work right. So this is what was in, in the standard in, in 1989. Uh, they had an Appendix D, and Appendix D lived all the way up to 62, 1990. Then it was removed, and I'm going to go into that a little later, just shortly, about why it was removed. But ba basically, they looked at office people, sedentary, which basically sitting down doing office work, so a metabolic rate about 1.3, and the generation rate was 0.3 uh, liters of, of CO2. Okay, this is illustrating carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is a, in a laboratory in... Uh, Hawaii, and as you can see, the CO2 level has increased. We hear it in the news all the time. We gotta decarbonize, that's what they mean by decarbonize. This is the carbon in the air, this is CO2 in the air. Uh, it's gone up uh, significantly, and so it's much higher than it was. So in this version of uh, ASHRAE uh, 62, they used 300 parts per million, that's that .003, but actually right now it's about 420 parts per million outside. Now it changes seasonally. The dips, the red line dips along the line, that means it's winter time in the northern hemisphere or summertime in the southern hemisphere because it's lower CO2 because the, the trees don't have any leaves on them and the trees aren't you know, uh, using the CO2. So it's all changing. And it also changes with the moon phase and it changes with, with, with other times. So I'm gonna use the, the 420 parts per million instead of the, the 300 parts per million and calculate a new ventilation rate. And it says 18 CFM a person for 1,000. So you have to realize that the relationship you know, is based on, on the outside CO2 because it, it's a mass balance equation um, that we're looking at here. You have a mass volume of air moving a mass of CO2 into the space. You have a person that's generating a mass of CO2 and that air is being diluted out. And you can actually figure out what the, the, the rate per person is by reversing the equation, by using some algebra there. But if I were to say it's 1,000 ppm in here, what's the ventilation rate? You can't answer that number because you don't have enough information. You don't know how many people and what the people's generation rate is. So CO2 ppm by itself doesn't tell you anything about ventilation rates. It's just a number. 
and you have to understand the relationship. So a, a, another person that's very much involved in ASHRAE, he's worked for NIST for 40 years, and he personally, he's gonna be retiring soon. He wrote this paper on CO2. I work with him on ASTM, where we're, we're actually writing a guideline uh, for use of CO2 in buildings. And he, there's a new equation that's, that that's was presented of how to, to uh, calculate the generation of CO2. So you have your respiration quotient. The respiration quotient is your conversion factor of oxygen into CO2, and it's based on the diet. So the respiration quotient, quotient for someone in Asia is different than the respiration quotient for someone in North America because we have different diets. Uh, if you're a vegan, you have a much different respiration quotient, but 0.85 is the normal American diet respiration quotient. The basal metabolic rate, that is the, the, the energy that we produce in our little uh, combustion chambers. Uh, to stay alive, to keep the heart going, to keep the brain functioning. This is the base, base level of energy. Then on top of that, we have the metabolic energy, okay, moving around. When you're sleeping, you're very still, little energy produced. When you're exercising, you're producing a lot of energy, a lot more activity, so you're, you're multiplying times that. And of course, density has an effect because, it's, you know, if we follow Boyle's gas law, uh, the CO2 is affected by the density, so temperature and pressure impact the calculation as well as measurement. So if we take a middle school classroom, that's all men, all boys, and we figure out the generation rate for these kids, we will take this number and calculate this number based on them sitting at the desk, doing normal work, not running around. Okay, we can take the ventilation rate from 62.1 and the, the mechanical code, and we can come up with a steady state CO2 value in the space, 1,129 approximately. Now, you may come up with a different number, which is, which is challenging because it's gonna change depending upon what your assumptions are, but I'm just using what's here. I'm using the mean body mass, so you're assuming average of all the kids in the class, and I use only males, and, not, and so I'd make my, my calculation easier because this data is split into males and the females. Um, however, if I were to do the same calculation for these, for these children in a gymnasium, well, I'm gonna change their activity level. They're gonna be moving a lot more. And because they're moving a lot more, they're actually generating more CO2. And so you're gonna come up with a different number, 2495. So if you design the space for 1,100 or 1,000 parts per million, but they're actually generating a steady state rate of 2495, it's gonna do one of two things. It's either gonna be in an alarm state or it's gonna be driving more ventilation to try to lower that rate if you're not limiting it. So I uh, had the pleasure <laughs> of working on uh, an addendum AB uh, with ASHRAE 62 over the last five years. Uh, this first came out in, in uh, 2018 and uh, the sausage wasn't quite done apparently. Uh, it actually had all the Andrew Pierce's calculations in there to calculate a steady state method for CO2. And it also had a dynamic method. And the dynamic method actually required measuring the airflow rates um, as well as measuring the CO2 in the supply, in the return, and calculating the differential on a real-time basis. Um, this was actually done by uh, actually Bill Bonfless, uh, a former professor uh, at UPenn, uh, Penn State, sorry. And, and uh, he actually did this in 2000, measuring uh, ventilation that way and CO2 that way. So, uh, this new standard just became a part of this uh, uh, standard as of October 31st, 2023. And what we did is we tried to simplify it. I'm not in full agreement with it, but it's better than what it was. And what we did is we put differential limits in the standard, so the space. So you can see how things changed because a lot of people were just putting 1,000 parts per million on the drawings and leaving it at that. And you can see based on the the ASHRAE minimum ventilation rates that these are the CO2 levels are. Now, so during the pandemic, they say, well, you should, we should keep CO2 level 800 ppm. Well, that's a lot more ventilation than, than the minimum. So how are you gonna achieve that? Uh, these ppm values are high because the ventilation is low. They're interdependent. The more ventilation you have, the lower the CO2. 
Uh, there's also an occupancy density uh, adjustment in here because it's based on the default occupancy, and the default occupancy in the table may not be the default occupancy. If you don't change, if you don't make this adjustment, then you're going to have a wrong CO2 value. And it also talks about the importance of sensor placement. In a room like this, where would you put the CO2 sensor? The front wall, back wall, side wall? A lot of places. Return? It's challenging to get the, to get the right measurement because you have to mix the entire air. And there's specific control requirements. It used to be a lot of people would take the control approach that when you hit the limit, say it's 1,000 parts per million, that's when you open up the damper. That's wrong. That means you're underventilating all the way before that. And so you, we wrote it so that you actually start ventilating off whatever the ambient is. So if the ambient is 420 or 380, wherever it is outside, once you start rising above that is when you start proportionally increasing the damper. Now dampers aren't proportional. They're not proportional devices. I worked for, for Belimo for 13 years. I can tell you all about dampers and actuators. Um, they, aren't, they aren't proportional devices, and uh, so they don't work linearly. So the, the, the control algorithm tries to make them linear based on the offset. So what I did in this chart, I just want to show you graphically what it looked like for uh, standard metabolic rate, what we're all doing right now, sitting down, very little activity. Uh, and what, what the ASHRAE 62 minimum CO2 levels are. And just again, to show you the, the shift that you have if, you, if you're doing a little bit more. I'm closer to 3 MET because I'm moving around, I'm talking a lot more. So I'm operating a little bit higher into the right with respect to the CO2. And just to show you, if you, if you try to maintain 1,000 parts per million um, across different metabolic rates, how the ventilation rate changes from something that is like 17 CFM to 66 CFM, just because you change the same, same space. You can still have an office, but all of a sudden you, you change the office to, to a yoga studio or a calisthenics or something else, and you're working at a much higher rate. The uh, NFL, I don't have this document, but uh, actually I have the document, but I didn't put it in here. The NFL decided to mandate that the, the CO2 level in, in uh, the workout spaces, in the, in the locker rooms, everything else, uh, if it hit 1,000, they had to evacuate the space. <laughs> we got big football players. They just have to move around a little bit, and they're going to generate a lot more than you and I, as, for, as far as CO2 is concerned. So yeah, they were having problems with that. So I was really disappointed when, when Carlos asked how many people saw the 60-minute episode, because I, I, I have snippets from it. But it, it actually, you know, I don't agree with everything Joe Allen is saying, but Joe Allen has, ha, is doing a lot of good for our industry. He's doing a lot of good for HVAC in what he's saying. He may not say everything that, that I, I, I think is correct. I'm going to point out some things. Uh, but he wrote a book called Healthy Buildings. I think everybody should read it. I've read it. It's, it's a really good book. It's talking about it's building buildings for health and not, and not per minimum standards. So in this first video. Carbon dioxide. That's right. The less carbon dioxide, the better the ventilation. Really straightforward. High carbon dioxide means you're not getting enough outdoor air from that system we just looked at. If it's low, you're in good shape. Then we don't. So generally, that is true. The higher the CO2, the less ventilation. The lower the CO2, the more ventilation. But you could have CO2 removing devices in there. You could have things generating CO2. Um, there's also something called CO2 lag, and I'm going to address that. If you have CO2 lag, it takes time for the CO2 to fill the spate. That's that equation that I showed you, the mass balance equation, is a steady state equation. So you have to reach steady state first before that equation really works. Um, so just because you measure, and that where you measure is also important. Do you have enough sensors to actually ad adequately measure the CO2 in the space? In this other video. Talking about carbon dioxide as an indicator for ventilation. Well, I can see in this building, all of these are under 800 parts per million. So that's good. That's great and really important. If a lot of people went into a space, the CO2 level would rise, this system would recognize it, the dampers would open up and bring in a lot more outdoor air. Okay, so in a steady state equation, if you calculate for an office space, what 800 ppm equates to in ventilation rate, it's about 25 CFM per person. So in his, in his mind, yeah, it's great, we got 25 CFM per person, and we're gonna provide even more when people come in, but it, it only works correctly, and you have to, have to know what's going on in the building. You actually have to know how many people are there in order to make that equation work. You have to know the generation rate. So I, I'm going to take an office building here, for example, and look at that. So you have uh, the CO2 level. The problem with an office building is generally, an op general office spaces are low-density spaces, at least in the ASHRAE standard. 
that may not be in reality, and that's why you have to make that adjustment for, for, for density. Whereas a conference room or a lecture room can, can is usually typically more, more dense. Well, less dense the space, uh, the, 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 and the bigger the space, then you have more space to fill before you get the steady state. And if you look at this, it doesn't get to 800 parts per million until, oh, there we go, about two hours. So it spent two hours below 800 parts per million, but the ventilation rate at that time, because this is, this is following AB, the ventilation is moving proportional. The ventilation design rate is 17 CFM per person, but at the time it, it reached 800 parts per million, it was just over 15 CFM per person. So you're providing not a lot of ventilation per person to the space but you were still at 800 or below. So the statement that Joe said was exactly correct. You have to know more about what's going on in the space. Knowing the ventilation rate is a good thing to know of what's going on in the space and you can determine. And I wanted to show this. This is an online tool created by NIST, uh, Andy personally and, and his group. Um, just so you show, it's not just me fabricating numbers. They come up with the same thing here. So I, I did this calculation twice. It's not the most dynamic tool, but it's, it's useful. Uh, and yeah, it showed basically, yeah, the same, the same, it takes five hours to come to steady state in office. <laughs> the work day is almost over before you come to steady state. That's how slow CO2, you shouldn't do the can demand control and ventilation in, in, in undensely occupied spaces. And so I actually substituted the, the, the 17 CFM per person rate for 25 CFM per person rate to come up to 800 parts per million, and it still took four hours to get to steady state, 800 ppm. Now we look at a, a high density space, like a conference room. Well, the thing about a, a conference room is it's designed for one thing, but is it, is it always fully occupied? No, it's not always fully occupied. Is it always used? It's not always used. So I, I decided to model here for you to show what it looked like a conference room that was designed for 50 people, but only had 10 people in it, and uh, what, what the rate was. And you can see after the one hour of people being in the conference room, that, which is the time they had it, they were just at, over 800 parts per million, and they were only at 9 CFM. Um, the design rate at that time was 11 CFM, uh, and which is which is actually high for a conference space because it's it's going to get lower as we increase the number of people, which, which doesn't make sense to me. Why we have such low rates? So there's something called occupied shutdown, which in 62 allows you, and it's promoted by 90.1 because it's a way of to save energy. Let's shut off the ventilation completely when you don't have anybody in the space. So this is one of the spaces that allow for occupied shutdown. So I'm showing you just we're providing zero CFM to the space right now, and guess what? The CO2 level is below 800, but there's zero CFM, so not 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 really good, and and. Uh, so now I got 25 people in for the next hour and a half, and the CO2 is going to climb really fast uh, because you have a lot more people, and, and so we're already up to 18, 1,800 uh, parts per million, but not totally. And eventually this, the, 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 the level goes up, and then you shut it down again. So the challenge is that we have a, a, st a steady state static equation, and we have a dynamic building. Most spaces are dynamic all the time, and, and CO2 is very lagging indicated. It takes a long time for CO2 to take effect. So there's other sensors. So having a CO2 sensor on the wall doesn't necessarily mean you have good IQ. It just means you may have low CO2, a high CO2, and that's it. But you may, may indicate the number of people we have in the space. It's, it's not a direct measurement of ventilation. You want to directly measure ventilation? Buy an Ebtron. Um, it doesn't identify the source here. This is very important. Pressurization is controlled by the amount of air you put in the space and the amount of air you move from the space or in a building that. If, if you have negative pressure unknowingly because things aren't controlled right, you could be dragging air up through the basement or through the wall or everything else. There may be something else in the air you don't even consider. A known contaminant you're not considering. So maybe there's radon in the basement in the school. Maybe it's uh, pulling air from a janitor's closet. Who knows? If, you, if you're not measuring the flows, then you don't know the pressurization if you're not measuring the pressure as well. Okay, it's, there's many assumptions involved in the CO2 measurement. Uh, CO2 sensors by themselves are impacted by the location, pressure, and temperature. A, a CO2 sensor in Philadelphia versus a CO2 sensor in Denver, if it's not modified in Denver, is going to read wrong. The calibrate at sea level, where we are, you go up to Denver, it's going to give you a wrong reading. So you have to adjust it for, for the location. And they all drift based on the technology that they have. They have background calibration against, say, 400 parts per million, but they're going to drift over time just the nature. 
So after I published a, a carbon dioxide uh, position paper, basically same thing as I just said. Um, they, they looked at all these studies, including one that, that, that Joanna Harvard was involved in, that's saying that, hey, high CO2, CO2 is affecting your health. Well, it's not really the CO2, perhaps. If high CO2 is an indicator of low ventilation, and maybe it's other things that are in the space, other chemicals, VOCs, particular matters in space. Um, the use of CO2, people are saying, if I walk, the people are still walking around with CO2 meters because of COVID, saying, well, if I have low CO, CO2, that means my risk for COVID is, is, is uh, is, is uh, lower, that partly may be true, but it's not a direct indicator because CO2 that we respirate is not directly related to the virus that we shed. Two different rates, there's no correlation between the two. And uh, CO2 is a lot of assumptions, and their accuracy, and uh, they, as I mentioned, you have, even if air cleaning technology actually removes CO2 and it completely destroys the equation, so we have to be cautious with this. So back to filtration and ventilation. As uh, Carlos said, you, you can remove contaminants by filtering them out. It's a very good technology. It's good that it's recognized. Um, it's getting more and more attention in, in, in 62.1, and, and obviously it it's, uh, has attention in 241. Or you can dilute the air by bringing in the ventilation. These things have been known for quite a while, all the way back to, to Billings time, that good filtration and good ventilation create healthy indoors. If there's other technology that can lower the, uh, the indoor concentration, that's good as well. So the Lancet Commission was, was, was a, a commission that was formed, I think Joan was actually the chair of this, uh, with other scientists to, to try to improve the situation. And, and they beat everybody to the punch uh, and, and made recommendations in uh, November of 2022, um, shortly following this, uh, watched the, the, the the president's office of science and Te technology took ASHRAE in and says, guys, you gotta do something about it. We want a standard. And that's how 241 you know, came and came about. But they recommended uh, either air changes or a ventilation rate per person um, with respect to uh, COVID and what's good, better, better. And it's interesting to see this better at 30 CFM per person. And that's why I wanted to show you the history. We were at 30 CFM per person in the past. So this is uh, something else that was in that 60 minutes. This is talking about air changes. And I'm just gonna play this quick, quick. And there's no volume. I mean, oh. offices, schools, local coffee shop. We haven't designed for health. We have bare minimum standards. In schools, the minimum air change by design is about three air changes per hour. And remember, we want at least four to six. This is all true, everything he said is true. Our, our standards, are, our band movement standards are not designed for health except bef before 241, and air changes are, are low. Schools are, are, are fairly good because schools are running about 13 and a half CFM per person, and so they have an air change every 20 minutes, about three an hour, approximately. And offices, air changes are really slow. Uh, so he made a comment, he talked about schools, but he was applying to an office building that he was, he was the, 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 the 60 minute interview was in. And an air change in this room is completely different than an air change in the office building because we have a lot more volume. We have a lot more air to change. So you, I'm weary about air changes and that's what's good about standard 241 and ASHRAE 62.1 is they look at the ventilation in the breathing zone where we are and a CFM per person rate and not the air changes. So just be aware of the air changes, not, it's not equal. So 241 brought us some new terms. Some of these things that Carlos already addressed so it's easy for me but it requires you to have a, a building readiness plan that you, if you have an existing building, that you go through the existing building and determine everything that's capable. As Carlos pointed out, you may not have the horsepower or the static or to, to move more air, so you have to write that down, what's capable, so you have to make a decision. Do I increase my horsepower fan to bring in more air? Do I change other things to do that? Or do, do, do I do something else, okay? Uh, infection risk management mode, he covered this pretty well. It could be enabled by the owner. It could be enabled by the, the, the mayor, who, whoever is. It remains to be seen how this is incorporated into the standard. But it's pretty cool. One of the interesting things, I'm not sure that Carlos covered, is, is this PZ. And, and uh, that is you can change the infection rate management mode by removing people from the space. Uh, that's an important consideration. So if you have 50% of the people in the space, then you actually doubled your airflow for existing airflow without changing anything. Your filtration may still need to be improved. That's one way to do it. 
Okay, so equivalent clean airflow. All the way back to standard 62, 1973, they talked about clean airflow. Clean airflow is important. So if the outside is dirty, if you have wildfire fire smoke particulate, then you should be filtering out the outside air inlet. As, is, as an addition to the recirculation air, you should be doing both. You have to make sure, but you have to know in this standard what the equivalent clean airflow is. What is the rate? You want to measure it. You want to measure the performance of the systems in the laboratory, and you want to measure the performance of the systems in situ, in the buildings. So you can get this. So they came up with this uh, aerosol reduction efficiency, which is completely new, which is really cool. Uh, so you can actually compare systems, not just standard filters and, and other systems that work together. So you can understand what the equivalent clean air efficiency is, the ventilation rate is of the clear air cleaning system. So you really need to know, what is the ventilation rate? What is the, your clean air rate? These are all rates. What is your, your, air, your, your recirculation rate? These are three things that you should know when you are doing 241. So the BRP is a living document um, because if you change something in your building, whether you change the mechanical system or you change how the room is used, then you have to change it in the document. If, uh, just as I, as I said, if you, if you took an office space and then all of a sudden you, you have a new tenant and the new tenant decides they're gonna make it a, a yoga place or an exercise place, then <laughs> you need more air into that space. So you have engineering controls that in, in, in your plan Okay, and that's, you know, so you have to list all the operation maintenance. 241 is very focused on operation maintenance. It took a section, which is chapter eight from uh, 62.1. This doesn't exist in the mechanical code. Uh, it's something that we're working on right now in the committee to revise, to improve upon, because it is old. Uh, it's very important to maintain equipment. If you remember back to the statement from the EPA talking about sick building syndromes, it talked about, well, some buildings aren't operated as well as they should be. Uh, one thing I, I, I am worried about is when people disconnect things. Oh, I'll disconnect it afterwards or I'll shut this off. And I, because they never get reconnected again and the building will operate for, because the, the poor facilities manager is, is putting out another fire or doing something else and completely forgot. So this is a, a place to document how the building is operating before you, before you dis determine what to do. And then there's allows you some non-engineering controls the occupancy level is the only one that counts to the ventilation, the clean air efficiency, or to the IRMM. Uh, but the other things may be good ideas. One of the challenges we had during COVID is people were cleaning, 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 because that's what we were told originally by the CDC. Every, we were all cleaning our groceries, doing all this stuff. All the off-gassing for things that people were using. For example, if you use hand sanitizers on a surface, well, hand sanitizers have, have uh, s different uh, lubricants built into them that you won't have in a regular alcohol. And these lubricants react differently on your hands than they do on surfaces. They become wells for bacteria and viruses. They mean to go. They mean to lubricate your hand, not the surface. So if you use a hand sanitizer on a surface, it can make things worse from a, from a perspective of, of disease is concerned. So as uh, as as we said, anybody can put us in a uh, IRM mode. We don't know yet. Airflow measurement it clearly states that you should measure the outdoor air in, in 241. I, and and I, I, I say you should measure the supply and return as well because you have to know what your recirc rate is. You have to know what your clean air delivery rate is. So you should be measuring all of them. Uh, you have to understand how the ventilation control is working. Actuators do fail. Uh, control sequences get out of, out, of, out, of, out of what they should be or they're not written, written well to begin with. Um, and understand the limitations. So one thing that I did in 90.1, I was working on 90.1, is, is, is we put in uh, higher requirements for lower, lower leakage dampers. Uh, so class 1A, AMCA 500. We also put in multiple speed controls so that if you have a constant volume unit, you, this, this thing has to unload, uh, to reduce the speed with the, with the load. So the closer you, closer you are at a set point, the, the thing uh, slows down. So you no longer really have constant volume equipment anymore. Um, unless you have an existing building and existing unit. So new units, they all have multiple speeds. If you're changing the speed, then you're changing a pressure relationship in a mixing box, and you change the pressure relationship in the mixing box, you're affecting how things, things operate. And this pressure ratio is gonna affect, is very important because you don't wanna put, uh, you don't wanna have the, 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 the sick people have a positive pressure room and have that spread to, to some, someplace else. There's a lot of performance testing in this, a lot of functional testing. 
which is very important, a lot of commissioning that goes on. And uh, I'm going to skip through these slides, but I'm just talking about outside air, this is standard flights, that we can have impact to the system through nature, through the pressure, through the operation of the system that can impact it. Just because I'm running out of time here, uh, the wind can blow on the damper and, and suck air in and work on the fan, or you can have stack effect. You, a, a balancer can set the, the unit up. In the, in the summertime, summertime, it's going to perform different in the wintertime because the, the column of air is there different. This is what I was talking about as far as uh, leakage. It causes hysteresis. So the actuator has a really tired time opening up against these seals. And so when you set it to 15%, for example, 15% um, from, from closed and 15% from open are two 15% levels. It doesn't reach the same spot, and it's called hysteresis. It's actually hysteresis in the actuator on purpose, so you don't blow it, out, blow it up. But this hysteresis is caused through the installation as well. And you have all these things that infect your outside air. So back to 241. Um, you can see, and, and, and uh, Carlos covered some of this, that the rates have significantly increased. Uh, like convention center, this, the rates there are the same as a conference room. So you have a nine time multiplier. And uh, this is the, the only thing that, you fit that, that, that 62, uh, sorry, the 241 gives you a actual EPR4 is the filters. Everything else has to be go through the appendix A. As Carlos mentioned, for, uh, independent testing, and then you come up with the, the efficiency of that solution. But they allow to use it. Carlos covered this and that. OK, so they have a calculator. I guess they built it into the two. This, so this calculator is showing. So we, if we look at an office space, an office space, as I said, low density with high ventilation rate currently. So it doesn't take much to go from 17 to 30. So I can, for example, go from 85 CFM of outside air to 100. 50 CFF outside air, I do it. Or I could uh, put in some MERV 11 filters, and I, and I, and I get even, even, even better in this, in this case. So it's an office space is pretty easy. But we look at high density spaces where you actually have low minimum standards. Now, again, it's, it's just because Ashray said this is, this is the airflow area, it doesn't mean you have to design that. You can always design more. You can always provide more. And uh, so. Currently, right now, we have uh, an office that's or a lecture hall that's 50 people. And uh, sorry, <coughs> yeah, it's 50 people. And the ventilation rate is 6.2 per ASHRAE 62.1. And we need to get to 50 CFM per person. So if I, if I double the outside air, you didn't do anything. You only got the, you only got 12.4. <laughs> because we're starting so low. So in this case, you have to use more than just ventilation to get there. And in this case, I put a MERV-13 filter inside the unit, and I put three air cleaners in the space. Um, and I got to the, just, just barely passed. Just barely passed, it's a lot tougher. Or, I half the people. I use a MERV-11 filter, and one filter in the space. One HEPA filter in the space, and I, and I met this. So this calculator is available th through ASHRAE online, <coughs> it was developed by the 241 committee. And it's, it's interesting uh, how it works, but it allows you to analyze different, different methods out there that are there. Ventilation is not only good for health, but it enhances performance. This is a study by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab that shows that productivity goes up with ventilation, um, and that's the value of it. There's another study by MIT that looks at the overall building. Like, like I said, the, the number one uh, thing in a building is the people. They're the number one asset, the most expensive asset. Most of our, our employers pay our health care. If you're our employer yourself, you pay someone else's health care, and you know the cost of it. It keeps going up every single year, regardless of, of, of everything else, your income and so forth. And so uh, this study of MIT actually re showed that 57% of ventilation is causing sick days. And the, the benefits of higher ventilation rates here. So you can actually find this information online as well. And JLL came about uh, about 2:15. They came out with this idea that, you know, in, in a building you spend uh, three dollars uh, for your t utility bill. So to operate your building, it's a three dollars per square foot to operate the building. Thirty dollars per square foot to lease the building, and three hundred dollars square foot to pay for the people in the building. So where's the benefit? The benefit is if you can get more productive people or, or pay less healthcare, it's in that 300 number, not the three number. 
but we've always been chasing this three number. Eventually, we're gonna run out of that number to chase because there's only so much you can do to reduce the energy efficiency in the building on the utility side. Um, I took part of this uh, healthy buildings into air quality uh, through this uh, association called CABA, which is called, now called Ashby. And there's some interesting finder from, from some existing owners. Uh, certainly right now, the focus on energy, they noted that. They talked about uh, the, why they would con incorporate uh, IAQ and what, what they wanna do is the house concerns and there's a lot of musty odors and, and dampness and uh, um, what the expectations of the people are. Another thing I, I, I discovered, which I've never seen before and I discovered it last year, that there was, there was a report from the WHO uh, from a working group in Europe uh, to write like basically a bill of rights or 10 commandments of, of, of right to healthy indoor air. And uh, they say everyone has the right to breathe healthy indoor air. Uh, they, there should be effective means of controlling it. We have to have systems that can very well control it. Just putting a CO2 sensor in the space or a thermostat in the space and saying it's gonna control is not enough. You have to have more controls in place. And all of us are responsible for this. We are the ones in the room, we are the ones that are responsible to make this happen. And there's the other ones. The last thing I'm gonna leave here with is actually in, in uh, Pennsylvania, there is a law that's in the book since last year that allows long-term uh, low interest rates to be provided. The Title 12, Chapter 23. Look it up in, in your law book and, and, and maybe you can get your, the, the city of Philadelphia, wherever you are, to, to give you some money. And I'm finished. I think that clock started a little late, so. I'm not really sure what the time is, but if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them.